All right, we're moving on to the cell membrane and transport. All right, we talked about cell, brain, cell membrane uh, earlier in the previous video. We're going to go into a little more detail now. So the cell membrane, we said, had many functions. Um, it functions as a protective barrier found around the cells. It regulates what comes in and out of the cell. It's selectively, selectively permeable, which means it chooses what the cell needs and helps the cell maintain homeostasis. It has receptors that are sensitive to the environment to find out what's going on around the environment, you know, and they can pretty much, it'll, it'll sense what the actual cell needs. It gives some structural support, not like a cell membrane, or not like a cell wall, but it gives some st structural support. All right, the cell membrane diagram. This is pretty much a diagram of what the cell membrane looks like. We talked about the phospholipid bilayer. All right, there's a bilayer, meaning there's two layers of phospholipids if I can get the cursor there we are this one layer of phospholipids and here's the second layer of phospholipids all right this is the inside of the cell cell membrane and then the outside of the cell all right we talked about the structure of the phospholipid you have a, a phospho a phosphorus head but which is hydrophilic okay it's a hydrophilic head which means it likes water so it points outwards towards the water and a hydrophobic tail which means it does not like water so it points inside away from the water all right and this right here is actually a protein channel we're going to talk about a little bit later where it allows things that are too big that can't just flow straight through the uh actual phospholip i mean the actual bilayer so it has to go through the channel just like the cursor is going and into the cell okay and the cell membrane is also called the plasma membrane just another name for it. The plasma membrane and the cell membrane are the same. The phospholipid bilayer. The heads are hydrophilic like we just saw and point outwards. The tails are hydrophobic and point inwards. There are cholesterol in between the actual tails of the phospholipids and we call it the fluid mosaic model or the fluid mosaic. That's another name for how the um, cell membrane looks and acts because there is a blending of fluid that moves back and forth. Certain things are always going inside the cell and coming outside the cell. The proteins. There are two types of proteins we're going to talk about that I showed you earlier. The integral proteins, a.k.a. the ch protein channels or carrier proteins that go all the way through the bilayer, which is like the one I showed you earlier. Um, they form channels. They can give structure or support to membrane, to the actual membrane. Uh, they receive information about the environment and what's floating around it to find what the cell needs. The other types of proteins are peripheral proteins. Peripheral proteins are only in one layer of the phospholipid, so that they do not go all the way through. And they can be enzymes, or some are actually anchor proteins, where they kind of give more structure to the actual uh, cell membrane. All right, now we're going to talk about cell transport. Okay. Uh, there are two types of transport. There is passive transport and active transport. First, we're going to talk about passive. Uh, passive transport requires no energy at all. The molecules move across the cell membrane without any energy. Um, the molecules move from an area of high concentration, where there are a lot of them, to an area of low concentration, where there are not many. So, where there's a bunch of molecules, they'll move from there to where there aren't any molecules. And remember, it requires no energy at all because the movement is with the gradient. With the gradient means, uh, a good example of that is if you were at the mall and you were going up an escalator, and if you just stand on the escalator and it's going up, you can just stand there and not use any energy at all and you will go all the way to the top. But if you were on that escalator going up and you decide to turn around and walk down, it would require a lot of energy because you are going against the gradient now against the gradient, all right? Uh, one of the first types of passive transport we're gonna talk about is diffusion. Diffusion is when small molecules like oxygen uh, can pass right through the cell membrane by slipping between the phospholipids. So in the example down here, you have a high concentration of molecules that are able to slip right through the phospholipid bilayer into the other side, and they will keep continue to do this until they form equilibrium or you know a stable balance between them so there are the same amount over here and pretty much the same amount over here 
Okay, that means it, it reached equilibrium. All right, another type is osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a membrane from high concentration to low concentration until it reaches equilibrium again. So it's pretty much the same thing, but it's actually the, mo the movement of water this time. Osmosis is the movement of water. Diffusion is the movement of particles or molecules. But they're both going from a high concentration to a low concentration and requiring no energy. The last type of passive transport we're going to talk about is facilitated diffusion. This is when you have large molecules like sugars um, that must pass through the channels in the bilayer. They cannot just go straight through the actual fossil lipids because they're too big, so they have to go through the actual channels. And this is the example I was showing you at the beginning where you have the channel protein and you have these molecules that are too big to flow straight through, so they have to go actually through the channel to get inside. All right, um, those are the three types of passive transport we were going to talk about, diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Now we're going to move on and talk about active transport. That key word, active, that means it requires energy. All right, this is like the example of the escalator when you're going up an escalator, but you turn around and try to walk down going the opposite way, which requires a lot more energy. So this time you're going to be going from a low concentration to a high concentration. All right, against the gradient. And we said it requires a lot of energy. Um, carrier proteins act as pumps. An example is the sodium potassium pump. Um, and they pretty much will ha they have to use energy and pump things inside or outside of the cell. Um, there are two different types of active transport. You have endocytosis, is when you need to pump things into the cell. And exocytosis is when things need to get out of the cell, when they uh, need to be pumped outside the cell. All right, you also have different protein gates. There are molecules. Um, these molecules are pumped through the cell membrane through these protein gates. All right, here's just an example of endocytosis uh, and exocytosis. So if something needs to get in, you see the arrows, then the cell membrane kind of opens up right here and allows those things in. And once they get in, the cell membrane pretty much reattaches itself and closes up like this. Okay, so mass is surrounded by a cell and is taken into the cell. And exocytosis is pretty much the, the opposite. When things need to get out of the cell, the mass is removed from the cytoplasm and is expelled out of the cell into the environment. All right, now we're going to talk briefly about three different types of solutions. When you have, you know, water and something else, like a solid or something in it. Um, isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. Isotonic is when you have the same concentration of water and solutes within a cell, all right, where it's balanced. Solute, I'll give a good example real quick. The solvent is like uh, tea. Like you drink liquid tea, and if you put sugar inside your tea, the sugar would be like a solute that's going to actually dissolve inside the tea. So the solute will always dissolve into the solvent. All right, when you're talking about hypertonic, um, it's a high concentration of solute inside the cell than outside the cell. So it's a higher concentration of solute particles inside the cell than there is outside, and they want to move from a, a large high concentration to a low concentration. So in hypertonic solutions, the cell will eventually shrivel up and shrink up. You know, it'll shrink in size and just shrivel. In a hypotonic solution, there's a lower concentration of solute inside the cell than outside the cell. So all the solute is going to rush from outside the cell into the cell, which will eventually make the cell swell up and burst.